All right, ready? No? <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, so, last time we talked about the electrical system of the heart, and so today we're going to talk about control of blood pressure. And you're going to find that cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure uh, just run rampant in our society. And so this is going to be a very important lecture for you to be able to understand because you're going to be using this quite a lot in your career. So we're going to start out talking about arteries and veins and how they interact and help us to maintain blood pressure. Uh, and I want to start out with a definition of blood pressure, okay? So, if we're looking at an artery, okay? And you know that blood is cruising through that artery, the heart's pumping, blood's moving through the artery. And as the blood moves through, the blood is pushing against the walls of the artery, okay? And as it pushes, it creates a pressure, okay? So we're going to say that blood pressure is the force of the blood pushing against the arterial walls. Okay, so it's the force of the blood pushing against the walls of the arteries. And this force also helps to move the blood through our system, okay? So without this force, the heart doesn't have the ability to move the blood all on its own. It requires that extra pressure within the arteries to continue that movement of the blood. And so we're going to talk about this more as we talk about those arteries and veins. Okay, so just a little reminder, okay, about things that you learned in anatomy, the difference between an artery, the difference between a vein, okay? Each of them have three layers. And the internal layer, we've talked about this before, this internal layer is that super smooth layer, okay? And we refer to this as the endothelial layer, or just simply as the endothelium. That's the inner layer that nothing is supposed to stick to, okay? And if something happens to injure those walls, that's how that plaque in the arteries develops. And both the arteries and the veins, as well as the heart, all have that endothelial lining, okay? And then the next layer is what really helps to make the difference between an artery and a vein. This is the muscle layer, okay? So that middle layer, and if you remember from anatomy, they were called tunicas, okay? So you had uh, the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. I don't care, this is not an anatomy class, but just kind of, hopefully that just sort of rings a bell. Um, but that middle layer, that muscle layer, that tunica media, on arteries is much thicker. This is all smooth muscle, and it's a much thicker muscle than in the little wimpy veins. The muscle is there, but it's hardly there. There's just like a little teeny tiny layer. Okay. Now, the reason that this is important is because with that bigger muscle layer, two things can occur. One, it helps to do what we call vasoconstrict. So in an artery, it's able to squeeze down so that the diameter of the lumen gets smaller. And it can squeeze down to one half of its original size, so it can get pretty small. Arteries can't really do that, okay? They can kind of sort of squeeze a little bit, but you can't see that serious vasoconstriction to one half its size. Only, did I say arteries? Yes. I'm sorry, veins. All of a sudden I went, oh, so, got that wrong. Veins can't really do that, so you don't really see vasoconstriction in veins. Now the other thing that's really important too is that the walls of the arteries, and 
truly arteries, because they're so thick, it also makes them very stiff and very stable. So if you were actually to put your finger on an artery, uh, you could poke it and poke it and nothing would happen. Whereas if you were to poke a vein, uh, it psh, collapses. Okay? Don't ask me how I know. But it collapses because it's not very stable. The walls are flimsy. Um, of course, it's no big deal because they come right back up again. The blood fills them up and they blow up like a balloon. But the fact that the walls of the arteries are structural, they're very stable, and the fact that veins are kind of squishy and movable, that makes a big deal of a difference when we're talking about blood pressure. So when we're measuring blood pressure, when we're talking about blood pressure, we're really only going to be talking about the pressure of the blood in the arterial side. We're not really talking about veins, we're only talking about arteries, and we're definitely not talking about capillaries, okay? And we'll get into why there's a difference in a little bit. Okay. Now, you know that the blood is coming out of the heart, right? And as it comes out of the heart, uh, especially when we're talking about when it's going to the body from the left side, it's shooting out of the aorta. And when those ventricles squeeze, when that systole occurs, the heart is squeezing really hard. Nice, healthy heart, squeezing really hard. So that when pressure enters the aorta, it's the highest pressure in the body. So this graph right here is just showing you the pressure in the ventricles and then the pressure in the aorta. And then as the blood starts moving through the arteries, the pressure starts to drop. And the reason it's dropping is because now imagine the aorta. The aorta now is going to split, okay? And the blood is going to move in several directions. And then those major arteries are going to split again. And they're going to split and split and split. And they keep dividing, okay? Um, by the way, I don't know if I ever told you this term, um, but something you should know. To bifurcate means to divide. So when that aorta splits or when that artery splits and divides into two separate arteries, we would call that bifurcate, okay? Just so that you know that term. So every time the arteries divide or bifurcate, pressure goes down just a little bit. Now eventually, those arteries are going to get smaller and we have the little arterioles. And so if you notice on this graph, when we get to the arterioles, the pressure has dropped even more. And then we have a ton of capillaries, okay? Lots and lots of capillaries in the system, so the pressure goes down even more. But notice when we're talking about the venous side, pressure is going down tremendously compared to the arteries. So the reason for that is when the blood gets into the venous side, that flimsy, smooth muscle is going to stretch when blood enters into those veins. And every time a vessel stretches, I don't care if it's an artery, doesn't matter if it's a vein, every time it stretches, pressure's going to go down. And because you know, you got these little wussy veins and they're, you know, not structurally sound. You add some more pressure in there and they stretch. And then you add a little bit more blood and they stretch. And because they stretch, there's not really very much pressure in veins. Okay? So that by the time the blood gets back to the right side of the heart, the pressure is practically zero. Okay? And blood is practically getting sucked into the right side of the heart. Which now here's an interesting thing. The heart has just enough oomph, just enough strength to circulate our blood through the arterial side, through the capillaries, and then into the venous side. And when it gets into the venous side, blood basically stops flowing. The heart does not have enough strength to keep pushing the blood through the venous side and back to the right atrium of the heart. It doesn't have the ability to do that. We actually have a second pumping system that helps to move the blood through the veins and back to the heart. It's not the heart itself that's really moving the blood through the venous system. So let's talk about that second pumping system. Every single one of our veins are sandwiched between muscle. Skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, 
even a few veins in cardiac muscle. Not a lot, but a couple. And every time muscle contracts, it squeezes on the veins. Now, here's one other difference between arteries and veins. Veins have these interesting little valves here. And when the muscle squeezes, it will force the blood upward. That pops the valve open. And then when the blood gets up to the next compartment, the blood will kind of come back down a little bit and it will close the valve. Really similar to the aortic and the pulmonary valve. So blood goes up through it, the valve pops open, blood comes back down, and the valve shuts. And this way, what's happening is muscles are squeezing as you move, as you walk, muscles are squeezing blood back up to your heart. So if you've ever noticed people who um, maybe they're older, uh, they may have some health issues, maybe they're overweight, and they sit for long periods of time, and their feet and their ankles and maybe even their calves start to swell. Why is that happening? I mean, you're young. I'm going to guess. Nobody in here is going to really get swollen calves or swollen ankles. Why are they getting it? Yeah, they probably also have very weak muscles. And the more they just sit there, okay, the more blood just by gravity is pooling in the lower extremities. And because it's pooling, now here's something else you need to know. When blood pools, and especially in capillaries, the more blood in a vessel, the higher the blood pressure. So if I'm sitting down for a long period of time and I don't have very strong muscles throughout my body, that water portion is going to stay, all that blood is going to stay in my lower extremities and the pressure is going to go up. And as the pressure goes up, an interesting thing happens. We start to see the watery portion. Now remember when we did the hematocrit and we spun the tube and you got to see the red blood cells on the bottom and the plasma on the top. That plasma has a lot of water in it. That's the watery portion. And so when I have a high blood pressure, what will happen is in these capillaries especially, I'm going to see that watery part start to move out of the blood and into the tissues. And now my tissues are going to have edema. So if they were to stand up and start walking and start moving those muscles, now of course if their muscles are really weak, they can't squeeze real hard. And it's hard to get that blood back up to the heart. The stronger the muscle, the more you use it, the better the pumping. So you can almost think of it like milking the blood, pushing the blood back up to the heart. And this is exactly what our muscles are doing. So you have smooth muscle, and you have skeletal muscle, and like I said, a little tiny bit of cardiac muscle is all about pumping blood through the venous system back to the heart. But now, what if I have a patient, and she is a quadriplegic, which means that she's paralyzed from the neck down. How's her blood getting back to the heart? Because it's not the heart that can pump that blood through the venous system. It's those muscles. She's obviously not dead. So how's the blood getting back to her heart? Smooth muscle. That's a big part of it. So we have a lot of smooth muscle in the gut. And it is still squeezing. And that smooth muscle can help to move the blood back to the heart. Now here's the only problem for that quadriplegic patient is it's really, for the rest of us, it's all about skeletal muscle movement. That's the majority of the muscle in the body, and that's the muscle that really gets that blood pumping. So you've heard, you know, you exercise, you get your blood moving, okay? That's because you're moving all those muscles, and you're getting a lot of return of blood through the venous system back to the heart. And that exercise and that movement of the muscle allows that to happen. For your quadriplegic patients, this is also why physical therapy is so important. And you're moving their legs and you're moving their arms because by doing that, you're also helping to circulate more blood. 
but it's also one of the big reasons why, over time, their body atrophies. You see atrophy of the muscles and tissue, and it's because we can't get enough circulation, enough oxygen, enough nutrients to that entire body. And so the more physical therapy, the better, but it, it's not constant like you. Even sitting here right now, you don't even know it, but your muscles are getting little zaps of electricity from your motor neuron, and it makes your muscles twitch. Now, I'm really glad I can't feel that because that would be really annoying in my opinion. But right now, your muscles are twitching. All your skeletal muscles are twitching throughout your body. That twitching helps to keep the muscle strong, which also helps to pump the blood back through the venous system. Now, by the way, when blood is pumped back to the right side of the heart through the venous system, I want you to know we refer to that as venous return. Okay, so now let me ask you one more thing. What about when you sleep? How's the blood returning to the heart then? What's happening when you sleep? You're not dead, obviously, so there must be some blood returning to your heart while you sleep. Okay, smooth muscle, yeah. But please, do you think that you keep perfectly still all night? No. No, and some nights you're tossing and turning and rolling, and you're moving your arms, you're moving your legs. Nobody keeps perfectly still, and there's a good reason for that, because it helps with venous return. It helps to get that blood back to the heart. Plus, when you're laying fat flat, um, your body isn't fighting gravity either, and so it makes it a lot easier to get the blood back to the heart. So just know that this muscle squeezing, uh, as well as the valves, the valves are very important, because if the valves weren't there, you wouldn't be able to continue to get blood up through the system. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is gonna be a problem for y'all, because you're gonna be working in hospitals, and like me, you get to work on cement floors. Invest in good shoes. Do not be cheap. Invest in good shoes, because I'm gonna tell you a couple of things that happen when you work for years and years and years on cement floors. First of all, your feet hurt. Second of all, your back hurts. Third of all, your legs hurt. You're tired. You want to invest in really good rubbery shoes that take a lot of the shock, okay? And you can have swollen feet because of all that cement underneath of you. So make sure you invest in really good shoes. But even if you do, you can be on your feet a lot. And because you're on your feet a lot, no matter how good that venous return and that muscle pumping is, because sometimes you're running all over the place, you're still going to have some blood pooling in the legs. And as that blood pools in the veins, the veins start to stretch. And when they get too much blood and they stretch out too much, it will rip the valves. It will destroy the valves. And so blood will always pool in that one section where there's no valve. And typically, very often, when blood pools in a section of a vein, the vein kind of floats to the surface, and you can see it under the skin. And what do we call that? A varicose vein. And is there anything you can do about it? No. And the more bloody looking type of thing, that means the more valves have been destroyed, and the harder it is for blood to move through those veins. Now, some people will go in and have those veins stripped out. I highly do not recommend that. That decreases your blood flow, plus it hurts a lot. And yeah, you don't want to do that. So remember, it's important. Move those muscles. If you have to stand around and do this, okay, you want to make sure you're moving those muscles so you don't get all those varicose veins. And invest in good shoes hundreds of dollars if you have to. It is totally and completely worth it. Just saying. All right, so now, as we talk about blood pressure, there are five parameters that we're going to go through, and all of these control blood pressure. Now, let me just say one thing. We're gonna talk about them each separately, and I don't know if we'll get through them all today, we might have to come back on Thursday and finish up, but we're going to talk about them each separately. However, when blood pressure changes in the body, all of these are going to be told what to do all at the same time. 
So typically, if heart rate goes up, peripheral resistance goes up. If peripheral resistance goes up, stroke volume goes up. They're all going up at the same time. So even though I only can talk about heart rate and then peripheral resistance, they're all happening together. And if I need my blood pressure to go up, all of these are going to stimulate the blood pressure to go up, but all of these can also help to stimulate blood pressure to go down as well. So changes can occur. So blood pressure goes up or down. So when I say it regulates blood pressure, it's going to keep your blood pressure at what you need it to be. Now, of course, you can mess up your blood pressure by doing all kinds of other things like stressing out from going to college. <laughs> Y'all are dying already. Anyway, um, so stress, and we'll talk about caffeine and nicotine and how it affects these different parameters, okay? going to go through these. We'll start with heart rate first, and then we'll talk about peripheral resistance, stroke volume, blood volume, blood viscosity. But I want to take a second right here and just say this would be the start of your essay. Okay? So we would start with all of these, and then we would describe each of these different parameters. So everything else I've talked about before uh, with changes in uh, arteries and veins, this will all be a few type of multiple choice questions. And remember, in your class, you're doing all multiple choice. However, I'm telling you that this is the essay because I want you to study it like it is an essay. This is the best way for you to remember it. You need to be writing this puppy down. And if you're not writing it down, and if you're not talking out loud to somebody about this essay, Remember I told you, if you've got a kid, you've got a niece, you've got a nephew, somebody in your life, sit that little brat down, no, I'm just joking, sit that wonderful angel of a child down, uh, pay them five bucks or whatever, because I think when my kids had to sit down, it was like quarter, now inflation, you got to pay them like five bucks, to sit there, okay, because like a candy bars. I saw, I don't, I don't usually buy candy bars, but I saw a candy bar being sold for $2.50 the other day, and I'm like, they are not worth $2.50. They're gross. I remember we used to be able to buy a candy bar for uh, 15 cents. Like, I'm old. <laughs> you people, I'm sorry for you. Uh, anyway, sit them down and talk to them and tell them the essay. They may not remember a word you say, but you never know. They might actually remember some of this one of these days, and you could be changing their whole life. Who knows? All right, let me erase this, and then we'll start talking about heart rate. So 
cardiac output is the amount in milliliters of blood that is ejected from your ventricle per minute. Okay? And we typically look at the left ventricle. All right? This is cardiac output. And then, of course, HR is heart rate, SV is stroke volume. We'll talk about all of those stroke volume a little bit later. Blood pressure then equals cardiac output times, and PR stands for peripheral resistance. Uh, a third equation we're going to go over, stroke volume equals EDV minus, or excuse me, is it minus? Yeah, all of a sudden I forgot, ESV. And we'll talk about what all that means in a little bit. Okay, so I uh, probably should put this down because I always forget to go over it. Uh, and then we're also going to go through something called the Frank Starlin Law. All right, so we're going to have a scenario that you're working in the ER and you have a patient and he comes in and he's been in an automobile accident and one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to take blood pressure. And blood pressure is low. It's critically low. Okay? And because of the low blood pressure, you assume that there must be internal injuries. Now what I mean by internal injuries is there's a bleed and blood is leaving those arteries and when the blood leaves the artery, pressure is going to go down. The less blood in the arteries, the lower the pressure. The more blood, the higher the pressure. And because there's an internal bleed, pressure is going down, okay? Now, in our system, we have specialized neurons. These are called baroreceptors, and they are in strategic places in the body to be able to tell us what the pressure in those areas are. So we have baroreceptors for the head portion, we have baroreceptors for the thorax, we have baroreceptors for the abdominal pelvic region. And they're all monitoring what's the pressure in all these very important places. Okay? So when blood pressure changes, baroreceptors are stimulated. So the baroreceptors in the carotid arteries are for the head region. In the aortic arch, they're the thoracic ones. And then in the kidneys, those are for the abdominal pelvic region. Okay? And these guys are all going to be stimulated because this person's blood pressure is dropping. Now the job of the baroreceptors is to tell the brain, hey, blood pressure in the body is dropping. And so where we're going to send this is to the medulla oblongata. And so we have what's called a cardiac center in the medulla oblongata, and this is going to be stimulated. The job of the medulla oblongata is now to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system.
And you know that the sympathetic nervous system's job is to release epinephrine and norepinephrine throughout the body as a neurotransmitter and even as hormones from the adrenal medulla. So all that stuff we learned in the general adaptation system, that applies to this. So now you have throughout your body a whole bunch of epi and norepi cruising around. And epi and norepi are really going to be the ones that control all these parameters. So what you're going to see is everything that I wrote here is going to be used again and again for all these different parameters that control blood pressure. Okay? But in this case, epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to bind to those beta receptors. So remember, when we talked about the electrical system of the heart, I told you on the sinoatrial node cells, there are those receptors, and they're called beta receptors. So those beta receptors are on those potassium funny ligates. And do you remember what happens when epi and norepi bind to those beta receptors? Why do we call them funny ligates? They have the ability to close, right? They're different. They're weird. The other ones don't close. And so we call them funny ligates. So what does epi and norepi do to that closing ability? opens and closes them more times per minute. Why do we care if the potassium funny leak gates close? What does 